we see it. Is. We feel that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. Ey ulan bizim halkların hakları gibi atlar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı. Ne fazla ne az. Pent up feelings that, that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. Get a lot of killers. Why well, you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Welcome to Varmblog, and today we are back with a uh, friend of the show, longtime guest for all things that I need to deal with. Uh, um, when I need to deal with Latin America, he's the first person I call to, particularly if it has to do with South America. Actually, actually don't take this the wrong way, Camilo. I don't call you when I need to talk about Mexico. But um, uh, so my, my resident... All things Latin American politics, uh, Camilo uh, Gomez, who's also now a regular in the champagne room over there at This Is Revolution. Yes, that was a, an interesting experience. So thanks, Derek, for having me here. And yeah, I will be contributing with, with This Is Revolution. So yeah, I hope to, to say some more interesting things about Latin America. So today we're going to be speaking for about an hour and 15 minutes-ish for the public, and we'll do about 45 minutes for the patrons only. Um, Camilo has agreed to do a patrons only Q&A, which means that my patrons, you need to be at the Q&A so we can ask questions. Otherwise, it's just going to be an extension of the same interview. Um, But let's start off here. It looked for the last year like we were seeing the pink wave 3.0. I say 3.0 because really there's been several tides of pink waves in Latin America, uh, starting with, you know, maybe the middle of the 90s, then again at the end of the Bush administration up through 2015, and now here. Now, I've talked with uh, Alex Hochili about the situation in Brazil. Um, I'm still trying to get a good handle on the situation in Chile, which is diff- which is very different um, because of the nature of Chile's economy from the situation in Peru and Bolivia. Um, and it's hard to get an exact feeling for what's going on in Colombia, but we can talk about Peru first. Castillo's cabinets have been kind of a revolving door in the beginning of his administration. He hasn't really been able to form a functioning government um, with his cabinet. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that the 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 issue is that, um, and I hope that it, it will not be sound too reductionist. But uh, the Peru is a very centralized country, so uh, a lot of the universities are in Lima or or in the main cities, like which are. Um, Arequipa, Trujillo, uh, which are uh, larger cities. Um, and in the interior of the country, there are very few universities, and there are what uh, people call um, uh, normales, normal schools, which uh, basically will be like teachers' college, basically. Like, yeah, so they're they, professional schools, right? Yeah, yeah, basically. So they will have a university status on like technical institutes. So a person that goes to a teacher's college will do a, a master's and a PhD degree, but they don't have necessarily the prestige or, or, or the quality of training of universities. So that's what a lot of the base of, of Peru Libre's uh, of the of the faction of Peru Libre that supported Castillo is, but also of the Peru Libre as as a, as a whole. So it, it is uh, a lot of uh, it is much. Uh, since so it is he, like educated, but not prestigiously liberal arts educated. It's educated as to go into the professions. Yeah, more or okay. less, it would be that. Uh, and, and and that is, uh, so they don't have necessarily, the, the PMC is not necessarily uh, that 
you know, were not supporters of, of, of Castillo per se. So yeah, in the beginning, and so much that tried... there's ever a PMC anywhere. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and in the beginning, kind of this, uh, um, this more technocratic, uh, more moderate left. Uh, uh, That's highly kind of urban had... in Lima, right? Yes, which is more urban in Lima. It was kind of having a, a, a an attempt to to support Castillo and, and its cabinet. Uh, where the ministers of finance, which is Pedro Franque, which is a reformist economy that 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 was, I think, functional in, in continuing a lot of the of, of of the in some ways of the um, to put it in some way uh, of continuing some of the policies from the past to try to not generate like the panic that has been generated in other left-wing shifts in, in the region, but at the same time, like with a very different rhetoric that, you know, like kind of the protecting neoliberalism rather than uh, a more rhetoric of, of inclusive growth. And and among its its uh, achievements is that Peru has been invited to, to, uh, to be uh, among the countries that are considered to join the OACD, which is the Organization of, of Economic uh, Cooperation of Development, which is kind of of the club of the rich countries, but in reality also in clubs middle income countries. Uh, although in Peru, the, the 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 issue is that the distribution of income is is so uh, unequal that that's uh, kind of a, a fallacy. But I think Pedro Franque was a central piece of, of the of this administration. The, the first uh, premier, the the prime minister, was someone from Peru Libre, but he was very conflictive. He had made a lot of sexist statements, and and he was ditched out for um, uh, someone who is also uh, from a moderate wing of the more reformist left. But she was not from the same party of of of, of Together for Peru, which is the the party of of, of, of Verónica Mendoza was the presidential candidate. And 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 of the minister of of finance Pedro Franque, or of the minister of of women, which is a feminist, and Aidurant, Durant, uh, but rather uh, someone from uh, Land and Freedom, which is a party that that is, is, I guess, more more social liberal than 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 uh, than Peru Libre. But it is a party that that is. Uh, it also has a kind of more rural component, so the it has been much more center on on environmental issues. And, and economic ones rather than, than the social uh, topics. So she was uh, she was an improvement. I think there was a, a vision of more pragmatism. Uh, but in, in in there were rumors at the end of the year that that uh, that the presence of her was in danger, and the presence of the of the of Pedro Franque and also of Anaí Durant. Uh, Despite that, they have been probably among the most decent in the cabinet, along with uh, the the Minister of Health, Hernando Ceballos, who also comes from from Land and Freedom, which is a, this more of a, a left wing environmentalist uh, party that 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 uh, that in some ways was a middle point, uh, in, rhetorically at least, uh, between the. The more reformist urban left and the more kind of radical rural left. So I will say that uh, you know, like vaccinations have been very successful, but it's curious that the government didn't use that much as a as a as a, as a way to to gain le legitimacy because it was very confused. Uh, like the advisors he has are seem very incompetent, and. The cabinet basically get to an end because of a, of a. It was a cabinet that was making some 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 victories. Among them, uh, the the minister of women and he Durant did a, a pension for for kids who had lost parents for uh, of, as a result of the COVID nineteen pandemic. And given that Peru is one of the countries where there has been one of the highest uh, mortality rates for for COVID nineteen, that's very significant. But uh, the cabinet was basically put to an end 
when there was a, a crisis in the police. So the the minister of, of uh, interior, which is the one that oversaw the police, wanted uh, Castillo to to keep uh, to to remove a lot of controversial figures within the police. So his attempt to remove these figures, he in the end he removed them, but he didn't want to remove like the, he removed the head of the police, but he didn't want to remove the others that he was saying. So this this minister put his uh, uh, signature of res resignation from the office, and that led to the political crisis of the impl uh, implosion of the cabinet. Um, so the new cabinet was. Uh, it, and that's the interesting part. It, Peru Libre has had the rhetoric of, 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 of the reformist left being the, the caviar left <laughs> in some ways, kind of a, a bourgeois left that is kind of comfort with, with, with capitalism. Uh, but at, at the same time, like his own administration as a regional government uh, of Peru Libre shows that they don't seem to have a, you know, a kind of... A, a, anti-capitalist streak, like they are also reformists in its own way, even if, if, the, the, if the accusations so are correct much. The, the Marxist-Leninist uh, rhetoric of Peru Libre, which people need to know as part of the rhetoric of, of Peru Libre, um, but it has done a lot to distance itself from the Communist Party of Peru, or like we like to call them here, the Shining Path or the Gonzalites. Um, also from the Communist Party Red Fireland and the Communist Party Pucayacta, which are two different tension, te uh, tendencies of, of Maoism, and from the Communist Party Unity, which is also, a, well, they, they, they come from the more Stalinist left. But, uh, they, right. Uh, I mean, one of the things that people need to remember about Latin America is the Communist Party's there, didn't go through a period of Euro communism or social democracy, and so, but they did go through the period of factionalization uh of that that hit the student left in america so a lot of these parties have like five or six factions you know what kind of maoism are we talking about there's trotskyist parties etc um uh, when we talk later probably in the parrot room about like the dsa international committees and all this this means that like navigating which of these parties represents what tendency that we can correlate it to in in the english-speaking world or even to like classical Russian Bolshevism is actually very hard because um, these parties have also had their own like local development and their own constituencies, which are regional or ethnic in Peru, right? Yeah. Uh, for example, the Socialist Party used to have an affiliate in, 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 in Puno, who was a political force. It, if a lot of, uh, of members of the Socialist Party were Quechua speakers, like uh, of, the, of the ones that were of, uh, of indigenous descent. Because uh, for different reasons, like for example, I might have been considered much more left-wing, <laughs> which it, it, it is also, they are considered more free market friendly, which could be sound as a contradiction, but but it, it, it's, it's true that there are some quite particular uh, Ethnic uh, dimensions to, to political organizations, so 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 that is a, a very kind of uh, unique of, of, of Latin America. But I will say that that is continuing with the political crisis. That well, there were some you know like ministers from Peru Libre um, and from other parties that that kind of supported, not supported Castillo, but wanted to have some, some share of power, those, those ministers were very opaque. Like uh, the, the, those, the ministers of the reformist left, quote unquote, seem to be the most, uh, the more functional ones, the, the, the ones that, uh, that, that seem to work better um, at, uh, at try to, to create a, um, some sort of uh, of, of reformist uh, uh, agenda in some ways, rather than just a continuation to, of the system like as it is. But I think that the political crisis that that led to this cabinet showed the the amount of corruption that, that there is in, in inside the police, which is very severe. And and Lima is uh, and, and and the whole country is having a very uh, severe 
uh, crime wave, which is uh, kind of led into a, to the idea of an, a tough hand uh, on tough on crime approach. And yeah, which which we're seeing return in the United States as well. I, I, I point that out, uh, Camilo, just to point out that a lot of people think that what's going on in the U.S. is unique to the U.S. and that it's and that it has to do with like uh, just our well, we have you know the high poverty rate doesn't help, but it has to do with like the politics around defunding the police or whatever. And what I would point out is we've seen outside of China and and uh, continental Europe that we've seen a crime spike everywhere in the world. Like it's 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 across the board, regardless of things like police funding. Yeah, I, I think it it also has to do that Peru is a very informal economy, and so mm -hmm. you know, like in, in many ways, many people the only way they have to resort is either the informal trade of, of some sort or or, or crime, <laughs> and, and and that is 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 there anything um, um, some some action also well in in other times we're we're more recent from from the Peru had a war with with Ecuador that's uh, another history in the nineties. And also the, the the war against the, the terrorist organizations led to to people who have fighting experience in in, in the 90s in the early 2000s joining uh, private military contractors in uh, that that went to um, to to fight basically for 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 the uh, for the U.S. in 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 Afghanistan and Iraq. Like previously, they have been argued that they were defensive forces, but the more recent times, there have been uh, testimonies that mentioned that they did uh, enter direct fighting. Like uh, the, because of, uh, and this is like, because of logistics, they were interior protecting convoys, but the, like distinct forces in, in, in those contexts try to, uh, uh, get hold of, of, of the convoys and well, the fire, fire started. So it, we know that, that they have, uh, you know, like uh, have not just uh, like this protective, uh, this idea of, of being as a kind of, of of private security in some ways, rather than than a, a force that that has engaged in, in combat in in, in some way. Um, so, and this is not just Peruvians, by the way. It's it's also Colombians and Salvadorians. Um, but uh, yeah, so the to going back to the to the to the question of crime, I, I think that the police is a very uh, corrupt institution, and 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 that has led to a lot of, of even the small crimes weren't able to be resolved, and people get killed for things as, as, that could sound very uh, stupid to get killed, but you know, sometimes someone is talking by the phone and, and it doesn't want to, to give their phone and they basically shoot the person. So, uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it, it's getting very ugly and that has led to a kind of, uh, of tough law approach that probably is going to be in, in place. Uh, there is, a, an emergency declaration, which, uh, which is currently under play and the, allows the police to basically go to, to a house without a warrant. And uh, although it's not seemed to be much use now, uh, but I do think it, it, rep it represents also a, a tendency that, that, that the Castillo uh, presidency promised in campaign, which was kind of, he, he, he is a, a rondero and then rondero is kind of this uh, rural vigilante that, that, that it's true in the most small towns, it's very difficult to, to have crime because you basically know everyone. Like, but that in 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 some contexts, like it's a, if there is an outsider, there there is a, a sense of, of trying to target them, like know who is this person that is, is going on. So um but in, in some more larger towns, it actually like gets some gets gets violent, like because like uh it's basically everyone attacking attacking one person that uh, that has either committed a crime or, or being considered that is committing a crime or something. So uh, the this cabinet led to to Hector Valer, uh, uh, which is curious because it's it's a congressman who was elected from a far right party, but he was among the few that that recognized uh, the the victory of Pedro Castillo. He was basically questioned by his party. 
and he uh, resigned. And he, uh, among with other dissenters, uh, among Peru Libre and other parties, created a new party, which is P Democratic Peru, that is uh, of the core of loyalists of, of Castillo. And he was named it. And, and then the accusations against him circulated that he had uh, physically attacked her, her wife and her daughter. And, 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 and then like the political crisis uh, uh, was kind of at its heat. Uh, also, he named a, 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 a member of Peru Libre who was very socially conservative. So the new cabinet uh, uh, was, you know, the removal of, 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 of the more reformist elements uh, within the, the, the cabinet, like the, the, the prime minister, uh, the, the finance minister, the, 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 the women's minister, and in, 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 in replace, like the, the new economist is, a, is a basically a technocrat, a, 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 you know, from, from the, the, has worked in the ministry of finance and on the central bank, and you know, like he's a centrist, like the, the press that is very critic. It, it seems like with them, they, they don't have any trouble, but a lot of the of the rest are much more loyalist uh, mm. of, 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 of Peru Libre more than even of, of, of Pedro Castillo. Uh, and, and it seems that is, is the quote of power. Because Pedro Castillo, in reality, is, is the president because the leader of, 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 of Peru Libre, like Mir Cerrón, couldn't run for president. So in some ways, Peru Libre is kind of a, a recent addition, uh, a, a kind of a, a political vehicle for Vladimir Cerrón. But at the same time, it ended up uh, giving a surprise with, an, with a candidate that was an outsider, not just to Peruvian politics, but to his own party which is, I think, a very curious development. But that cabinet fell, and the new cabinet was, uh, they put a, a question at Justice Minister, as, as Prime Minister, but what it was surprising that, that they, um, they moved the, the Minister of, 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 of Health and have put a very, Hernando Ceballos, who has led uh, a vaccination process that has been very successful. Peru now has uh, around um, almost 70% of its population is vaccinating. It's, it's, uh, it was uh, in the last counting 68%, so it, it keeps growing. And We can so, talk about uh, why Latin America as a whole, except for Brazil, has been better at vaccinations than everybody else, but. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah that's, that's an interesting topic. Uh, so it, it's a it's a very high vaccination rate. It has been key in the vaccinations, and they have removed him to put someone a loyalist of of Peru Libre, and and that has created a lot of of of, of anger even among of people who were kind of supportive of Pedro Castillo, and a, a, a call to remove him. Uh, you know, and it was revealed that the, this new minister Hernan Condori was has. Um, He's been involved in acts of corruption and, and in kind of selling uh, fake uh, medical products and things like that. So it, it is uh, it is generating a lot of of of, uh, of uh, commotion in, in in the population, even among his supporters. And a curious thing that also happened was that he put a feminist back as 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 as, as women's minister. So I think this. Uh, this relationship of, of of Pedro Castillo is is, is 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 I think it's he's very pragmatic. If there were larger political forces on 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 the more social liberal wing of the left in Congress, I think we will see a much more different political configuration. But since the the political forces are are much more moderate on, on, on social issues, I think we are seeing and, and even conservative we will say. Uh, we, we are seeing a, a, a much more um, uh, a, 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 a cabinet that it's 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 much more moderate. So it, this cabinet, I don't think it's a shift to the left. I think it's a shift. It represents kind of the quote of power of of, of Peru Libre, of the party of Castillo, 
but also many argue it's a big bet for Castillo because they don't know if 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 in the end like uh, Peru Libre like it has shown that it, it's it's uh, it's uh, it, it's not loyal to, to Pedro Castillo. They refuse yeah. an impeachment against the 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 president of Congress who had argued that Pedro Castillo was an illegitimate president in an international trip and. Recently, it was uh, pointed out that there was a um, a meeting in a in a uh, in a hotel among you know like the the representatives of of, of, of the right of the Peruvian right uh, and to to coordinate a coup uh, against uh, Castillo, basically, or coordinate a removal of Pedro Castillo. And curiously, one of of, of the members of the right. Uh, said that the event was founded by the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, which is the think tank of the German Free Democratic Party, which is a right-wing libertarian party in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it, it, it's it's very, like, it was surprising that. So he is admitting that there is a, a, a foreign government, a, a, a political organization for, from other party uh, supporting the ousting of a of, of a Peruvian president, and, and I think that is going to to lead to a lot of of curious developments. So when Castillo is weak, the opposition always uh, somehow managed to be worse, and 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 that's I think why many Peruvians, despite the many faults of Castillo, are still uh, doubtful against an impeachment against Castillo because they think Congress is going to be worse. So, how popular is is uh, Peru Libre outside of the Castillo presidency? Like, how popular is the party by itself in in Peru as a whole? Not, I know it's I know it's strong regionally in certain areas, but in Peru as a whole, how popular is like if if there is a referendum uh, and would Peru Libre win enough seats to hold its own government? by itself? I don't know. I, I think that the regional elections that are this year are going to be approved because I think they are stronger regionally and I think they could show off some some of that strange regionally. But I think in Lima they are fairly weak uh, for different reasons uh, because part of the of the Peruvian left in Lima is, is, is much more social liberal. That's, uh, that's one, one reason. But but also because kind of its center has always been uh, the regions. Uh, uh, and someone, uh, when uh, uh, Paulo Rinot, a, a Peruvian historian, was, was, was putting a quote of, 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 of Mariati about like, regionalism is not an ideological expression, it's an expression of discontent. Uh, which in the Peruvian context makes sense because it, we like this, it is a party that has a very radical rhetoric, but in Congress it votes with the with the far right, even like because like it, it, it's it's its it center has become this attack against the the caviar left, which I guess in in the U.S. would be like a, a millionaire socialism or something like. Uh, the, so I I think that there is. A, also, I think there is some, something very important to have in mind. There is a, 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 an involvement of education in this political crisis. So a lot of uh, Sunedo, which is the, 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 the university regulator, um, has uh, closed a lot of universities, of private universities, who had low quality and many were linked to, to politicians. And... and so the right-wing parties want to open them, uh, again, those universities, and also a faction within Peru Libre wants to do that. Uh, I think there are, you know, like uh, with the informal transportation, I think that in some ways Peru Libre is the representation of those informal interests, but of those informal interests that have some degree of, of relationship with, with, with crime even, because like, uh, mm -hmm. the, the transport, uh, the transportation, the informality generates a lot of, of accidents and things like that, but they have impunity because they have been able to, to create a, a lobby. So it's not the representation of those more marginalized, but but of, of those kind of uh, of, of entities of, 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 of kind of lobbying power 
rare than than the than 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 those on the margins. So this actually brings up a whole lot of of regional issues, and we can talk about where where Peru is unique or more like. Uh, frankly, Peru is in its developmental, you know, phase is like entering the possibility of the OECD as a middle income country, and this and the other is more like say Bolivia than any other, you know. Um, uh, major South American state that I can think of. I mean, it may be one of the Gways, but it's it's very different. Um, from the movements in in Colombia and in Chile, I think, which are which are more, you know, urban. Um, they, uh, they, they do have a large working class support base, but they, they're far more centralized in major cities than in Peru. Um, at least from my understanding, uh, from studying those cursorily. One thing I have a, a question, uh, here is economically, has the new government done any good policies or is it Ortega style situation, you know, which was also people forget the Sandinistas freak people out because they were also on paper, a Marxist Leninist party. Uh, and and uh, they didn't really do much. In fact, um, the Ortega government actually ended up neoliberalizing more than the right wing government did. Are we seeing similar things in with the Castillo administration in, in Peru that we should expect, particularly as uh, and this will pivot us a little bit as Latin America braces for a Fed interest rate hike um, that it's going to you know, maybe oversee austerity itself? Uh, I think it is It is interesting what the, 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 the question, I think that curiously the, 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 the biggest uh, economic victory uh, in, in some ways of, of, of the government was kind of control inflation, which is not necessarily seen as, as kind of the of left-wing priority, but it was kind of needed in the, in the context of, of hiking prices. So that's uh, probably the, the most... Uh, the most uh, country about economic liberalization. I think it's interesting because I think the, even the EMF at one point praised the uh, Ortega, which is kind of curious. But uh, I, I think that this new minister uh, and some of the criticisms from from the from even some people that were more moderate, the the the, the left wing, uh, the Pedro Franco was the the, 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 prime, the finance minister where that he didn't have that much uh, political experience and that, you know, you, for a finance minister, you need someone with experience, uh, you know, with political experience, because one thing you, you could have a PhD in economics and, and but at the end of the day, particularly in, in a country where parties are very weak, uh, the ministers have to be on, on TV defending the policies, not, not, not the congressman, not, not, not the not even the the president in itself. I haven't seen. Don't remember the president's really talking that much about about economic issues. Uh, at, at, at least at, 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 as a central point. Um, so it's complex what what it could happen. But I think that there is some sort of of attempt of regular of regul of try to formalize certain informality. But continuing with with this uh, with this uh, attempts of 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 of, um, of kind of half answers to, to problems because I don't see a, a dramatic economic shift. Um, uh, I I think that there is a. The the difference in many ways is is that this rhetoric, almost libertarian, that let all things be solved by the market, is kind of dying. Even if libertarians are, and, and I wouldn't call in them even libertarians from a principle point, but libertarian talking points are becoming much weaker uh, because there is a left wing historian like uh, Jesus uh, Cosamalong who is. Uh, a really great historian, particularly in human history of, of Peru. Uh, and, and he was argued the other day in the anniversary of Lima, which uh, then something very relevant happened that day also. But uh, 
he was saying that the criticism against against uh, against uh, Hernando de Soto has at, at the early point was very dumb because it didn't uh, put at the center the the idea that uh, there are a lot of criticisms valid to de Soto, but what it wasn't false is the idea of an, the entrepreneurial spirit of of, mm. of, of of Peruvians and Latin Americans, because given that the state gives very little opportunities, there is a way that, you know, they, they need to uh, have some, you know, like a possibility of, 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 of reach yeah, Central and South state. America can't survive without a gray market, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, it's the entire a way, thing would fall apart. In some ways, it's 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 a way to reach a safety net. It's 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 basically having some sort of of of, of, of private money rather than, than than the state. So I I also think that he mentioned something that is interesting and. He mentioned that the more traditional right in the 80s had a, a, a rhetoric about an invasion because a lot of, of, of people who were migrating in, in, the, in the 80s to, 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 to Lima were uh, Andean immigrants. So they were immigrants from, from Andean areas of, of the country, which were much more indigenous than previous waves of immigration, which were much more uh, uh, from coastal areas, so much more mestizo uh areas of, of the country uh, you know the, so i do feel that the answer for for the soto was not restricting um immigration but rather like uh, that 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 his vision uh, his vision didn't make that much sense because it, there were very few regulations going on so it, it's it's not that what what happened like but but kind of the context of the 80s and the the, the whole political economy of Latin America. Kind of dire situation which very few places really escape. Um, so uh, the other element that I think was important that he mentioned is that the left in the eighties also was lost because the left didn't like that much two expressions of, of, of Peruvian popular culture: football, which is really central even today. And, uh, and 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 chicha, which is a form of, of cumbia that is really powerful, and and I think it is really important to understand that chicha, which cool, sound very curious, uh, it, it, it sound is, is particular even among the cumbia, but uh, it 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 was more than just uh, in a musical sense interesting. It was interesting because of of, of the reivindications of, of a class ethnic perspective and. And a lot of the of the more uh, urban left was was kind of dubious, like uh, they, 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 they hear it like, uh, as weird, and also they think that the football was kind of a distraction. So those elements that were kind of uh, central were were missing links that, that the left didn't see. But that was in the context of the anniversary of Lima. They were talking about that, and in the context of the anniversary of Lima. Uh, Repsol, which is the uh, an Spanish oil corporation, uh, had a massive oil leak in the coast of Lima, the, the biggest oil leak in the history of Peru. <laughs> so, uh, and and there has that has also highlighted the sense of, of, of private uh, companies acting uh, with a lot of incompetence. That is just not just the state that is really incompetent. But also private corporations, and they try to cover up. So it 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 it, it has been a, a mess, and and that's a, a, another crisis that is not just the the, the COVID nineteen crisis or the or the or the political crisis, but the environmental crisis because that has led many people also without a job because like uh, in some parts of, of, of the coast of Lima, it was literally like full of oil. So. Uh, um, Fishermen couldn't couldn't go, go working because it, it was you could not uh, uh, sail basically. So I have one question, and then we'll pivot to talk about larger Latin American politics in Peru. Uh, this uh, question is: How much uh, there is there in the way of Chinese investment in Peru, and what potential is for that going forward? I will just say my understanding is that while there's a lot of Chinese uh, interest in say places that are largely shut off from Western trade, like Venezuela. Uh, Cuba, uh, uh, to some degree Bolivia, 
that China actually is not as heavily invested in Latin America as as people assume based on their assumptions from the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and its interest in Europe, uh, South Asia, and to some degrees uh, um, Africa. Uh, but is that true in the Peruvian case? Is there a lot? I mean, I know there has been some pivot towards towards China. But have they seen a lot of Chinese investment or is it just something that people kind of throw out there as kind of like, well, maybe the yuan will be our way out of a, you know, our way into more developmental, you know, policies. But have you actually seen that materialize in any way? There is some Chinese investment uh, and, and also it's more pointed out that the vaccines that Peru mostly use were Sinopharm, so Chinese vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that in some ways people see a particular relationship with, with Peru and China because Peru has a, the largest Chinese diaspora in Latin America, but it, the Chinese officials that don't see necessarily that way, the things, because the diaspora has diverged a lot from, from, from what Chinese are. A lot of the diaspora is Catholic, for example. And, you know, China doesn't have a Christian majority, like much less Catholic majority. So in many ways they have drifted. Uh, and uh, unlike the Japanese, which were slightly more recent, like a lot of the Chinese, like a lot of some of the relatives that came to Peru, it came like, you know, like uh, a lot of decades ago. So it's it's not even a, a very recent memory. Like in the case of Japanese, you, you will find Japanese that, whose parents have been born overseas. So that's slightly different because there is more connection. Even some of the of the Peruvian Japanese, uh, some speak even the, in the language. In the case of the Chinese, like with the exception of some more recent immigrants, like that's not the case. So there isn't a whole lot of hope that, that China is going to be a kind of golden ticket for Peruvian development, even if relations with China are pretty good and there is some Chinese, some significant Chinese investment in Peru. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this leads me to the, the, let's let's pivot out a little bit before what, before we end the show and look at the larger prospect of the of the Latin American peace wave. There is um, the most likely outcome of the of the Brazilian elections is Lula returning to power. Um, Lula is a beloved figure in America. If, if I am honest, this is partly because of the obsession of our late friend Michael Brooks. Um, uh, I have I have pointed out that that this understanding of Lula misses how much of an Obama figure he actually was. In fact, there was an, a fam somewhat a famous exchange where Obama talked about how Lula was, you know, the more uh, the more famous, I mean, the more well-beloved version of himself in Brazil when he was doing outreach uh, to Brazil to kind of pill it off of the BRICS coalition um, way back in the day. But that it's already clear that uh, the Lula government will not be even taking a reformist stance as broad as it did during its first period which in retrospect was was not very broad right like it just it just wasn't um so where does that where does that leave the castillo government it, what, what I, actually what i have not heard from anyone is what the castillo government's relationship is to venezuela and cuba and and how how it 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 feels like it's going to be pivoting to other latin american uh, left-wing movements and governments at a moment when it looks like the Federal Reserve Banks of the world are about to pull the carpet out from under uh, a lot of the ability of the Latin American left to get funding. Yeah, to, to put it uh, bluntly, in the the the, it seems like a, a tendency within the na naming of the foreign ministers uh, has been the, the moderation of, of them. So the, the mm -hmm. current uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Relationships uh, is, is quite moderate. So, uh, and, and the previous one also was kind of moderate. So it, it makes statements against uh, the, the election of, of, of Ortega, for example. Um, 
so but at the same time there, there is a feeling that that uh, that you know like obviously castillo has not you know it's not central for him opposing venezuela or, or, or cuba but you know he's not he doesn't seem to to be much of a fan also per se the case of peru libre and his party is much more different i think that the, that you see in vladimir Serrón, which is the leader of peru libre and and he he comes uh, he he studied medicine in in, in cuba you, you see that he is is is, is in in many ways a, a, a huge fan of, of of the cuban revolution and and of cuba and also a, a, a staunch defender of, of maduro but uh, i don't see that there is really since Peru Libre has a lot of, 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 of Congress seats, but also it's not majoritarian Congress. I think that foreign relations have not been the, at, at the center of the of the of the administration uh, uh, policy positions. Right. So and there we need to note for American listeners that at Peru, like most of the world's Congress system, is parliamentary and model, not the American. Uh, majority model yeah yeah th there is just one congress so it doesn't seem to be like that much shift in in foreign relations there was a recognition of the sarawi uh, arab republic which is the 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 the, the, the country that, that that claims independence against uh morocco uh, mm -hmm. and that angers uh you know some some right wingers but beyond that that's probably the only uh, left-wing vision in foreign policy that that, that has been um, carved out. Uh, so, so I, I think this also raises another crucial point, Camillo, though, that the Americans tend to view Latin America, by Americans I mean United Statesians, um, uh, tend to view Latin America as, you know, when it has a pink wave, it tends to view these as like a, a movement that is continental and not national in its orientation, but that's highly misleading in that like what's driving the left wing movement in Chile and what's driving the left wing movement in Peru are actually very, very different. Right? Yeah. And I would say all the pink wave have a common element, which has been nationalism. To be right. frank, uh, like uh, Hugo Chavez uh, would talk about internationalism. His symbol was Simon Bolivar, who is the national hero. And he even waved the, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the spade of, of, of Bolivar and things like that, you know. And and in the even like uh, I, I always find funny the, the the woke discussion around Latin America because uh, very recently, like uh, curiously, uh, like with much less uh, effect, uh, Gabriel Boric did a, a declaration in which he said we need to protect our borders. So like it's. It's not, you know, like a, a kind of uh, uh, libertarian socialist, uh, you know, kind of uh, more internationalist kind of mindset, rather uh, uh, different shades of nationalism uh, permeated. Even when, uh, and, and that I think you have also mentioned in a previous show, even when it could sound weird, even some Trotsky, some proto-nationalists in, in Latin America, which oh yeah, it's yeah, for it's sure. strange, but it happens. I um, mean, it, it's it's also why the, the the class theories of Latin America are frankly a little different than um, the class theories of classical Marxism. And when I say the class theories, I should say the class theories of Marxists in Latin America. The focus on say comprador classes, for example, comes straight out of Latin America. And the idea of, of uh, national consolidation projects and, you know, local uh, valorizing local bourgeoisie, et cetera. Um, uh, I, I would say that the difference is the Workers' Party in Brazil was actually not that, that it was more of a liberal social democratic party in the American European sense, um, ultimately, in the way it actually ran the country uh, than some of the other Latin American left-wing movements, including Sanders, uh, Chavezismo. Um, uh, and, and Chavezismo is interesting as well, because there's nationalism and there's a Bolivarian figure. Uh, but there was also, while the, the state was highly Marxist-Leninized, it actually did set up workers' councils and it, it, the equivalent on the early 
Soviet model for certain areas, but um, the whole state's infrastructure was dependent on oil revenues, um, which meant that it was very easy for changes in foreign policy to be seized on, um, like tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia to undermine the oil market of Venezuela, thus leading to the hyperinflation crisis that it currently has. And when I've talked to certain leftists in America, they, they, they make it sound like Venezuela was pegging its currency to the dollar out of a policy choice, as opposed to it had to sell oil on the market and OPEC takes money in dollars. Um, so it's it, it's uh, it's a very confusing thing when I hear American leftists of whatever variety try to analyze Latin America when I'm like, yeah, but that's not really what's going on there. The local context is is very clear. Uh, I would say, however, that might not be as true in Chile, um, despite its, you know, Pinochetist roots and, and all that. And the Pinochet constitution finally getting overturned is we must remember that, that the southern cone, Chile and Argentina, um, are the richest countries in Latin and South America, like by a lot. It, it, well, may, except for maybe parts of Brazil, right? Like, like you know, we think of them from the from the standpoint of the United States as as mid income countries, but from the standpoint of like their neighbors, they're well off. Right? If you compare the GDP of Chile to the GDP of say Peru, um, Peru doesn't look super bad, but Chile is way more urbanized and and well off yeah i will say that you know like it, it is a, a a source of of comparisons and a lot of indicator chile it it's it, it, it end up better than peru the indicator where where i think that uh that 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 is a big difference is the cause of housing which in in chile particularly has increased a lot and and I think in some ways, like the cost of living is, is one of the demands of, of, of the movement, like uh, of the protests in Chile also happened because of a rise in, in the metro first. So um, that, that is a, a different dynamic. Uh, it, Lima is getting uh, expensive, but some you know cities in the rest of the country are not that expensive. Like uh, although also the issue with the informal economy is that you don't have necessarily a, 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 you know, that this month you're going to make this exact amount of money. So any emergency kind of, and, and particularly like the COVID-19 crisis, which has hit a lot, has in some ways led to, to a series of, 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 of callings for, for a state to have a, a bigger role. I think that in some ways um, the, the pink wave was, uh, was, uh, had a lot of the original being way had a lot of of, of different uh, different ways to look at, at things and mm -hmm. and I think some criticisms to the being wave are that it, it looks uh, soft on, on on drug trafficking but there are also articles being written about the Uruguayan government being soft on on drug trafficking and trying to not combat it because if you really want to combat drug trafficking, you end up with a situation like Mexico, which basically like the state was uh, like the, was in a literal war basically for, for moments against the cartels were for a decade. <laughs> for a decade. Yeah. yeah it's, I, it's mean, I lived there during the cartel wars. I mean, one thing I would say about, about Mexico is it's funny is uh, even action national, uh, which was the right wing party of Vicente Fox and, uh, Calderon, um, yes. uh, um, was in its rhetoric, it would do what the U.S. asked it to do and, and, and pursue the drug war. But both of them were like, the drug war is dumb. Like, w why are we doing this? Uh, it's accelerating violence in our, in our system. And it actually led to the reestablishment of the PRI, but the PRI being so corrupt, it actually, you know, fell apart. And now we have AMLO, which was the left-wing opposition. But again, AMLO's coalition, as, as I've talked about on uh, TIR, and I think uh, Camille has talked about it as well, is yes, they've done things like remove references to neoliberalism and free market ideology from the textbooks, uh, but they haven't reformed Mexico's economy hardly at all. So it's and in some ways, they've even been soft on certain things, such as like uh, stances towards Trump in the United States, 
to appease the right, the Action National uh, coalition in government and some of the conservative regional governments. Um, and so it's 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 led to like the American left not knowing how to parse or understand AMLO because they don't understand local politics in Mexico. Um, and I, I speak about that a lot because it's this, it's a country I know because I live there. Um, I, I also have uh, pretty deep ties to Colombia. Um, and uh, as people who listen to any time I talk about Peru, I had a Peruvian partner once. So um, these are the countries that I kind of sort of have some ties to. So I feel like I can at least ask the right questions. Um, you, What you won't see me doing is pont patent, uh pontificating on the goodness or badness of what's going on in Chile on my own, for example, or in Colombia on my own, because I don't have the context of all the complicated local politics to actually speak to it. And I refuse um, to be one of these people who is either against or for some Latin American politician or Codillo uh, solely because they have socialists in their name are because uh, I heard uh, something on YouTube about how mean they were once. So um, I think we have to we have to be serious about the complicatedness of Latin American politics. But this brings me to my last question. That whole caveat aside, uh, why has the vaccine uh, initiative in almost all of Latin America but Brazil, where it was actively impeded? by the president, regardless of whether or not the country was left-wing or right-wing, are, are well-off or not well-off. Uh, some countries have had very bad death rates, uh, Peru being one of them, there's others, um, Brazil being another. But um, why has it been that you don't have the vaccination kind of crises in Latin America that you do in... Um, in Africa, with like the Sino, it's the same vaccine. Even like most most of the vaccines in Latin America have been uh, Chinese produced because China was much more willing to not patent hoard, um, and so and uh, had its production up a little earlier. Um, and while the Chinese vaccines have been just as ineffective against Omicron, for example. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it still is the case that Latin America has fared even better in some ways than North America, than Anglo North America in its vaccine rates. Now I actually kind of have a theory as to why this is, but, but Camilo, why do you think um, this was so much more successful than it was in say Africa or South Asia? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't think I'm, I'm the first pointed out that, you know, like, this has been also a comparison has been made on on, on 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 Europe that you know like Catholic countries have higher uh, uh, vaccination rates and even if Latin America now is much more less Catholic than it was used to be, um, Catholicism is still uh, central to to the Latin American identity in the sense that many people. Uh, many of the uh, Protestants uh, in Latin America, evangelicals uh, particularly, are uh, were Catholic at one point, and even some evangelicals go to to Catholic schools because evangelical schools are considered bad. Uh, and I wonder why. So, huh? I, never mind. I, I I was being sarcastic. Yeah. I, just said, I wonder yeah, why. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I think there is an element in which Catholicism has a very family focus. So the, the fact that that uh, in Latin America, a lot of several generations live together uh, make that, uh, you know, a lot of people, even if it's not big fans of the vaccine, like that's a, a less possibilities to, to, to infect your relatives that you live. So that I think has led to, to, to massive interest in vaccinations. Uh, even in Brazil, where, where there was a, a Bolsonaro was against uh, vaccination, like the regional governments have been able to, to do a kind of successful vaccination uh, campaign. Among the Spanish-speaking countries in Latin America, the least vaccinating is Guatemala. Um, and my theory is because the left is very weak and the right, even if it's uh, pro-vaccination in some countries, it's not, you know, like it's it's center and and 
And even, but it, 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 it points curious cases like Bolivia, which has a left-wing government and still the vaccination rates are, are not that high, like 40-something um, percent, uh, it's growing. But when they introduced the vaccine pass, the, the protests were from, from right, but which is quite common, but also from the left. So, so it yeah, has been, yeah, yeah. So it has been kind of a, a mix, but in general, you know, like a, a much higher percentage of, of it is still the most vaccinating region in, in the world, and that's quite impressive, given that that, that there is a very much more limited resources in our countries. I also yeah. will say that what, what I have been saying... You don't produce most of your own vaccines either, like like either China, Russia, or, or, or the West. Yeah. So, like, that's also an issue. Like, the a lot of the medical, uh, of the healthcare personnel is very committed, and they, they vaccinate even in the more remote regions of, of the country. Like, sometimes, you know, driving a, a you know, like... A, in, in the so, in the most adverse conditions, a lot of the healthcare workers have done a really heroic uh, uh, journeys along the most remote areas. So I was going to say the other thing I would say about Latin America is all, almost all, everybody who receives uh, a doctor's education in Latin America has to do service in a poor community in most of the countries in Latin America. This is something that if you don't know it, you do now. Um, so even in Mexico, uh, and Mexico has, has a nominally socialist healthcare system, although it's socialist hospitals are a scary, scary joke. I've been to them. They really are like, they're the horror stories that you hear about from right wingers. <laughs> like there's no needles, you, you, whatever, but they do have it. Um, but the doctors, like all doctors in Mexico work in these clinics part of the time to, because most of them have their, their schooling at least somewhat subsidized by the state um, because they need doctors. And so to pay off for the, the benefit, they do, they do community hour work in these clinics, which means they're also more familiar with the impoverished regions of the country than, than uh, and, and nurses even more so, um, obviously. Uh, and so the, they go out to these clinics all the time anyway. So they're used to being local community doctors and they're known in the community. You know who these people are. If you're a poor peasant farmer, you know who the clinic doctor is and you trust them. This is not the case in either, in either Europe, despite having a lot of socialized medicine or in the United States and Canada. All right. Even though those systems are socialized, they're not diffused amongst normal people, except for some nurses who live amongst regular people because nurses nursing is a middle class job. But even that is limited, right? And I think I think that plus I also agree with you, Camillo. The whole family size issue with Catholic countries are, are two things that really drive this that are absent in America. But I will I will push slightly back on the Catholic thesis only in the fact that it didn't. That isn't what happened in the United States. While the Latin, like I've mentioned, uh, the uh, the Latin community in the U.S. has been more likely to get vaccinated than, say, the Black community, um, probably for different reasons, like uh, fear of exposing someone with undocumented status or something like that. They've been somewhat hesitant to deal with um, the apparatus in the United States because even to get a free vaccine in the U.S., they ask you for insurance. Like, even though the insurance isn't going to pay for it because everything in the U.S. does that way. So you go to get a government vaccine that's covered by the government and they're still going to ask you for your insurance paperwork because it's free if you don't have insurance. But they have some deal with the insurance company if, if you do, et cetera, and so forth. And this shuts people out. And so the benefits of large families didn't didn't translate until very recently uh, where Omicron seems to have changed uh, those um, those notes. People also saying lockdown policies were different. Yeah, lockdown policies were were variant, but lockdown policies are variant everywhere except for in the European countries. Because one of the one of the studies that I will cite for the United States that misses this point is listening to rural workers talk about you know the being anti uh, lockdown and then workers in the cities being pro lockdown. 
is perfectly correlative to the number of COVID cases in that region. And it's and the only reason why that's not obvious to us is because we have red states and blue states because of the federalization of the country. And so the, the policies of different cities in a red state are actually tamped down upon. But you'll find that that like people were okay with lockdowns when there was bad COVID cases. The rural areas didn't have as bad of cases. And even if they had a higher death rate, it affected less people. Therefore, they weren't as concerned. And that shouldn't surprise us, right? Um, uh, someone says the UAE has a 95% vaccine rate because most people in the UAE are, are, are probably guest workers and uh, thus have to be vaccinated to be in the country. Um, I, mean, you, I, I was surprised that you could go to Dubai. I'm like, I met like two Emiratis out of like a thousand people. Um, uh, also, Dubai is a is like a, a a shopping mall for the super rich on the moon. Um, it's a very strange place. Anyway, that's completely unrelated. But 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 as a as a region, we have to give Latin America props because they're like. It hasn't the divide, uh, as Camilo points out, the dividing factor isn't even right or left. Like it, you can't. You, it's not. That's not the true dividing factor. It's. It, there seems to be some other things in it. I don't understand what's going on with Bolivia. Bolivia confuses me a lot, actually. Um, <laughs> like when people are like, "What's going on with uh, with uh, with Bolivia?" I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't. You know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I would say that. Hey, so thanks, Camilla, for coming on. For those of you who uh, are patrons, give us five minutes and we're going to take your questions on the patron channel. Um, uh, so um, come check us back in in five minutes so we can go refresh our drinks and whatever. And we'll talk, you know, for about 45 minutes more for patrons. For everybody else, I, I wanted the important part, the update on uh, Peruvian politics to be free and available to the public. So enjoy. All right. Thanks, Camilo. I'll see you in five more minutes. Thanks, Mike.